please welcome back to a late show senator cory booker senator i'm not entirely sure uh where to begin uh our discussion about what happened tonight um can, can you sum can you sum it up how would you describe what we just sat through i mean it, it was painful and I, I think that if you're not hurting or worried after what we just watched uh maybe you tuned into the wrong thing i mean Donald Trump came with this obesity of aggression and and just like a pugnacious posturing that was just not who we want to represent us. It's not representing the spirit or the heart of this country. And I respect a lot of what Joe Biden was trying to say and do during that election. He came far more presidential, frankly, but uh, Donald Trump, I, I mean, to see a Fox News commentator have to try to constantly wrestle with the president of the United States just so Joe Biden would have time to speak. Uh, it was embarrassing to our country. Uh, and yet another example of how Donald Trump's heart is so discordant with, I think, what the heart of America is all about and what the spirit of this country is about. It was it was hard. It was painful, Stephen. And I, I, I think you're right. I think people out there who saw that um, and I imagine the first debate's usually the one that gets watched the most. I think people were in pain to watch that because, as I was just saying to our friend John Baptiste, it was absolutely embarrassing for America to see that. See the president of the United States not being able to shut up for just two minutes. Or did, I don't want to say shut up, just be quiet and allow someone to speak for two minutes because it seemed clear that he knew his ideas could not win. He could only win through... Um, well, through domination or aggression. Um, yeah. How do you think Biden did? Well, well, first of all, there's a sense with Donald Trump, it's almost like, you know, Putin doesn't have to go through these things. Why do I even have to be here? And I'm just gonna try to bully and dominate the night. And so what I liked about Joe Biden is he kept trying to turn it away from the two men on the stage and back to the American people. At one point, he did this impassionate plea. This is not about us. This is about you. This is about you. And trying to keep it on the people and people that are hurting. I mean, look, we are at a moment in America where addiction is up, life expectancy is down, suicides are up, our, our, our disparities in wealth are greater than they've been in generations. We are at a time where our economy is, is, is a double digit unemployment. I mean, there are so many things that people are struggling to and Donald Trump tried to keep saying that everything is greater than it's ever been and he's, as he says, the best president we've ever had. Uh, and so I, I just appreciate that the patience that we saw within Joe Biden in trying to continue to bring the subject back uh, to the American people and to what was going on, despite Donald Trump, who just said things that left me gobsmacked. I mean, uh, making claims that were just wildly wrong, like, you know, that he created 700,000 manufacturing jobs when the loss, the, the, the fact is we've lost 200,000 manufacturing jobs under his watch, you know, constantly just putting out things that were not true. And then I think the most hurtful moment for me, for Joe, a guy that I've gotten to know well, is when he talked about the sacrifice of his son, uh, 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 you know, the son oh. that, that, that Bo, that died, that served honorably in the military. And Donald Trump didn't even, didn't even pause. He just treaded over uh, that hurt and that pain treaded over the honor of his service to try to score more cheap uh, uh, hits on 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 the vice president uh, based on lies. And so the whole night was just sad that our commander in chief was just so ugly uh, uh, amidst Joe Biden trying to do what he did with me. I was on debate stages with him, which is actually to discuss the issues that Americans really care about right now. You know, I, I saw in what you were, I saw what you were describing in Vice President Biden's face. I saw that, I saw the same pain that we're talking about, but I think, I imagine that it comes from a particularly special place for him, not just because of his natural empathy to understand what the American people are going through and what they want from a leader right now. And I think there is that, that is that sincere desire in the vice president to fulfill that need for the American people to be a, um, a moral example for the nation as, as uh, FDR called the presidency, essentially a moral office. But the pain I saw on his face was knowing what a president can be like and feeling this pain 
for what he sees our president being right now, a pain for America. Like, it must be heartbreaking for him to to have the presidency and a relationship with the president not be a theory, to know what that person can be. And I don't mean just Barack Obama. I mean people that Joe Biden didn't support. But Donald Trump is an abomination. He is a stain on the office of the presidency and his behavior. And I saw that in Vice President Biden's face. Well, two points. One is, you know, Joe has this sort of reverence for the office. He, he sees it with a sense of humility. He actually knows that no individual, woman or man, is big enough to fill what the presidency is, the awesome responsibilities. And that's why he approaches it with humility and a sense of gravity. Donald Trump does not at all. He treads upon the awesomeness of the responsibilities. He has a level of arrogance and even uh, a disdain uh, for the virtues that we need right now. And in, in one of my most intimate conversations with with Joe, we were driving, I was going to endorse him. We were driving from Flint, Michigan to Detroit. And it was one of the best I'd ever felt. You know, I just dropped out of a presidential race and now I was going to endorse the guy that beat me. And he seemed to understand that right now, perhaps more than any period in the last 50 years, what, the, what we need from a president is someone that can heal us that can remind us that the lines that divide us are, are nowhere near as strong as the ties that bind us. He, he yearns for us to see that in this moment in America, we must put more indivisible back into this one nation under God. And, and, and so maybe that's why the moment of this uh, debate that was like a dagger to the heart of, of that American aspiration and, and that is truly menacing to all that we stand for. You see, I, I know in my personal family history what it has meant to see our society collectively reject the KKK. It, I know what it meant in, when, when the Klan was marching in Virginia, in the same city my mom did a sit-in in, to see this country resoundingly reject the Klan and, and, and Nazis, which American blood was spilled fighting in Europe. And when this president was given the simple opportunity to yet again condemn hateful groups, he, he didn't just fail to condemn it as you and John were talking about. There was something even more chilling that is real. He said, stand back and stand by to the Proud Boys, a right-wing hate organization, stand back and stand by, that they are now online using those words almost as if they're licensed from the president of the United States to stand ready in an election to engage. There is a dangerous, menacing reality going on right now where the president of the United States is failing to endorse the American 200-year tradition of a peaceful transfer of power, a president who has said, undeniably, if I lose, this election was rigged, and now he is calling out to right-wing white supremacist organizations and telling them to stand by. And, and so that, to me, was so frightening, so anti-American spirit, so contrary to the heart and the soul of this country. And to me, he has violated his very oath uh, uh, to defend a constitution that speaks in spirit to this understanding that we are a nation that sets a democratic example globally. So I just want people to know, to listen to him tonight. It, 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 as, as a great poet, Maya Angelou said, if someone tells you who they are, believe them. And, and it is a frightening thing, but we've got to turn our fear into fight or worry into work because we do have the power we as a country are more, the p power of the people is greater than that man that's in power. And I want to talk about that power and how people can exercise it when we come back right after this. Senator, um, l let's talk about something maybe a little bit hopeful in all of this. One of the, the moments that I thought uh, was best for Vice President Biden tonight is when he looked in the camera and basically said, don't listen to the hopeless messages you get from this man. You get to vote. Your vote will be counted. You decide 
whether you get another four years of chaos and lies from this man. Not him. Yes. The, isn't, that, isn't that what we have to take from this? We, we do. I mean, that's the exciting thing about this great American experiment is we really broke with the course of human events and created this profound nation where the people get a say. And this is one of those elections where we all have to realize the only thing necessary, what are you going to do right now? Uh, you know, King, there's the Birmingham jail. We're not to the white supremacists, the KKK. He said, I'm writing to the moderates who are doing nothing. It's not the vitriolic words and violent actions of bad people, it's the silence and inaction of good people. And so this is the moment that if you haven't decided that you're going to vote, if you haven't made a plan, as, as Michelle Obama said, ready to like wait in long lines or pack two lunches, this is the moment where you get to determine the destiny of this nation, not Donald Trump, no matter what he says, no matter how much he tries to uh, uh, jangle uh, threats and, and, and menaces. This is our decision to make collectively as a country. It's not a referendum on him. It's a referendum on us on who we are and what we're going to do. And if you don't know how to vote, go to betternoahballot.com. We have how to vote by mail. We have how to vote early and on the day of for every state. Go check it out. Now, let's talk about um, a subject that came up tonight, a couple times, actually. And it is about um, the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to replace the seat uh, of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, you're on the Judiciary Committee. How do you imagine the next couple of weeks are going to go? Do you, do you know at this point when the hearings start? Um, forgive me for not knowing that. Yeah, uh, mid-October, uh, Lindsey Graham, who said explicitly uh, uh, months ago that if, if we, a, a vacancy comes open, we will not try to fill it. Use my words against me. Right. Now he is breaking his word. And, right. Uh, and I'm uh, from South Carolina, and there's one thing they care about down there. It is honor. And that is a dishonorable thing to have done. I, I am I am actually stunned. The video is very clear. He said this after the Kavanaugh hearing. That's it's, very sweet that you're stunned by Lindsey Graham lying. That's very uh, nice of you. I, I call it naivete, but I, it, 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 to me, I still have to be a prisoner of hope when it comes to people who look you in the eye and say what they're going to do. For this to be a, such a sudden flip, uh, is is just disappointing when people have already started to vote in America, and when this Supreme Court justice they're rushing them on the court to get there before the oral arguments on the Affordable Care Act. Donald Trump says I'm going to tear down the Affordable Care Act and all the protections for people with pre-existing conditions, all the protections for people that might have exceeded lifetime caps. Remember those before yeah. the Affordable Care Act, so that we can tear down your health care. So but also so he can have nine justices on there and he wants people he's appointed in case he can drive this election all the way to the courts. That's another yeah. chilling moment. Yeah, he wants to take it out of the hands of the people and ballots that may have been mailed in before the election day but may arrive afterwards. He wants to try to call that illegitimate and drive it to the Supreme Court and let his picks uh, decide his fate. And, and that makes me call into question what kind of conversations. He already asked Comey. We know he went to somebody and said, hey, uh, are you going to be loyal? He had loyalty tests for his uh, 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 for other members that he's been able to appoint. The question is, is what's going on with this Supreme Court nomination? And that's why I believe she should recuse herself. She should say right now to the American people, I'm not going to politicize or delegitimize the highest court in the land. If they're not going to wait like the majority of the public wants them to wait, wait until after this election, let the next president decide, then at least I'm going to try to give some, some level of integrity to the courts and say I will recuse myself from any matters re revolving around this election. Uh, so far, uh, we know that um, Schumer, Hirono, and Blumenthal, uh, Democratic senators, plan to boycott meetings with Amy Coney Barrett. Are you going to meet with her? I'm definitely uh, arranging to have a conversation with her before the hearings start. I want to have a very direct and honest conversation with her about my belief that she, uh, for the sake of our republic uh, and the integrity of the court, she should recuse herself. Look, R Ruth Bader Ginsburg didn't know the outcome of this election, but her last public statement was to request for them to wait. And I think she did that not because she had some insight that who would win, but because she just believed that the legitimacy of the court in the eyes of America has to be sustained. And for this to be violated, I'm really hoping that uh, uh, this nominee understands her place in history and will recuse herself. Well, um, Senator, thanks for being here. Uh, good luck with those hearings. I hope uh, they are 
Uh, I hope they are less embarrassing in the end than tonight's debate was. Um, and um, we'll see you soon. Senator Cory Booker, everybody.